Good afternoon, October 16th, 2023. This is Dr. Vikram Gupta coming on to you live. And uh, I'm sorry we missed it last week. Uh, I just had some good duty to take care of and I couldn't move the time. So <laughs> it, it happens. Uh, but anyways, uh, I would like to welcome everybody back and uh, thank you for everyone's support uh, so far. I hope everyone can hear me well. Um, uh, hopefully, um, that should work. Anyways, uh, let's get started. An interesting week last week. Uh, it started getting a little chilly, a little cold. So, uh, the weather is changing. I had a lot of patients come in with, um, uh, cough and cold symptoms a lot, in fact. So that means as the weather is changing, we are starting to see viral activity go up. Some people, um, uh, tend to develop, uh, uh, slightly more complicated symptoms. Uh, I thought COVID had uh, calmed down a little bit because I got a lot of negative COVID results with a lot of uh, positive viral symptoms, but um, uh, I just had uh, an older lady uh, get admitted to the hospital with COVID. It's, it's been a while since I had any one of my patients actually get admitted to the hospital with COVID, but uh, uh, again, nobody's uh, immune and... Uh, this lady, uh, in fact, has had some uh, uh, vaccines, but not the new booster. And I think she was vaccinated a year and a half ago. And since then, she said she's not interested in getting any more vaccinations. So either ways, uh, she's stable, uh, doing okay. And, uh, you know, I was trying to reiterate the value of uh, vaccines and uh, vaccinations uh, that are more age appropriate and, uh, sometimes, uh, season appropriate or time appropriate, um, towards uh, preventive healthcare. Uh, so, uh, let's talk about, uh, I, I think, uh, I talked about vaccinations and especially like the, all these, uh, new vaccines that are recommended during the season, which is the flu vaccine, the, the new COVID vaccine that's come out and uh, the RSV vaccine. Um, but uh, besides that, uh, you know, we, we have other preventive health care that uh, is uh, pretty important. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk about health care uh, with regards to uh, uh, preventive health care uh, with regards to what uh, the purpose is and uh, why we should uh, pay attention uh, and uh, try to get uh, in on this early with regards to uh, what is uh, necessary and sometimes what is not necessary. Uh, so I'll tell you, preventive health care is... Uh, um, you know, I'm going to think out loud. I did not really prepare for this, but since we do this all the time, uh, patients ask questions and, uh, it's interesting. Um, it's interesting how, uh, you know, different people will ask me the same question under different circumstances. So we try to answer that. Uh, so first of all, I, I tend to look at preventive healthcare, as and now this is not primary care this is preventive health care uh, uh, it is uh, in the childhood uh, well even during uh, pregnancy uh, there are uh, predetermined uh, durations during the pregnancy that people uh, that the women have to go into their doctor get tested they get uh, blood work done an ultrasound done and uh, sugar testing done they check the thyroid and sometimes they'll start taking uh, some preventive uh, medication, uh, vitamins before they even plant uh, pregnancy. So that's all preventive uh, care. And then when the baby is born, there's uh, postpartum visits. Those are also preventive to look out for things that we anticipate can go wrong. And then as uh, the kids grow, there's uh, every year there's uh, some kind of recommendations, uh, what vaccines are needed, and uh, see, uh, and they're more age appropriate when their initial doses, and then their boosters, and uh, accordingly, as we get older, um, you know, preventive care starts 
changing and there's less of requirement and more of monitoring. Uh, and that's what I'll uh, what I kind of want to talk about a little bit. And then the before the easier or the other second half, which is slightly uh, shorter to explain, is it's uh, seasonal uh, or situational. Seasonal is there are certain vaccinations like the flu vaccine or the uh, RSV vaccine uh, or the COVID vaccine. They generally recommend it. Well, uh, let me just stick with the flu vaccine for now uh, because it's a seasonal vaccine. It's not, oh, I got it this year. You might have gotten it in January and it's uh, October. You're still supposed to get that vaccine. So it's not a yearly vaccine. It's a yearly seasonal vaccine. So whenever the flu season comes, you get your vaccine uh, for that season. And uh, the other vaccines are preventive. Uh, the RSV vaccine, uh, they are to prevent uh, prior to the flare-ups uh, or increased activity of these viruses. COVID is tricky. We don't know yet. Uh, is it going to become a yearly thing or not? So I'm going to uh, be cautious about COVID, uh, calling it a seasonal vaccine yet. Uh, we'll see how that plays out. Uh, and then there's the situational. Uh, there's some vaccines that are required, like if, uh, uh, you know, young uh, kids are going to college and they're, they're going to be staying in the dorms, um, then they need certain kind of vaccinations. Uh, a lot of my patients, uh, if they're going for pilgrimage, uh, uh, especially to Hajj in the Middle East, um, they'll need certain kind of vaccinations. Uh, if you're traveling to certain tropical countries uh, over there, certain other vaccinations are required. Uh, now there's some vaccinations and some prophylaxis, uh, whether it's malaria, typhoid, uh, yellow fever, stuff like that. So those are situational. If you're not traveling and if you're not going to certain remote areas, then you don't need those vaccines. But if you are, then uh, it's highly recommended. And in some cases, it's mandatory that you get that. Uh, and so that, that, and, you know, there might be some other nuances, but this is the big picture. And so these are all around the vaccines and, uh, yeah, if you get hurt, uh, and if you, uh, if you, if a cut injury, um, outdoor accident, um, uh, where dirt, where, you know, dirt is involved or the wound may get uh, dirty, um, then, tetanus booster is uh, required if you're not already boosted. So these are uh, kind of become in the adult age more situational. Uh, what about preventive healthcare besides the vaccines? What else uh, is necessary and important? Um, so they are, that's basically divided into, uh, you know, as an adult, uh, a lot of my patients see it as a free visit that uh, the insurance, uh, what they hear that the insurance recommends that you get one free visit with the doctor, which means your deductible will not apply and your co-pays will not apply. The insurance mean to say you go for a preventive healthcare visit. Patients hear it as I got one free visit. Uh, but either ways, uh, when we're leaving those uh, insurance complications aside, uh, what is uh, expected during a primary uh, during a preventive care visit is uh, obviously we see you know if uh, and here we divide between age groups uh, and the same preventive care visit uh, is handled slightly differently depending on what the age is. Uh, there are certain uh, things left to judgment, but mostly. Um, age-wise, because we know certain things happen more at a certain age and uh, differently at different ages. So if, if uh, so, I'm going to go with the younger people going all the way to the adults and see if we can cover that. And obviously, if you have questions, just uh, put them in the chat down below. Um, so, uh, so what we have is like... Uh, let's say we're 20 years old, 19, 20, 21 years old. Uh, at that time, you're coming in for a wellness physical uh, uh, 
a preventive healthcare visit, or whatever you might want to call it, uh, or what your insurance wants you to call it. Uh, so over here, they are usually vaccinated. They've had all their vaccines. Maybe tetanus booster is required. Um, and uh, But other than that, they're generally, uh, they're all caught up on their vaccines, unless it's seasonal, flu shots and uh, COVID shots. But uh, generally, they'll be otherwise good. And uh, then we do some blood work to screen for general conditions uh, that are common. And they, they are relatively common. Uh, they, they're more like a screen for an inner snapshot of you. Like, what's your cholesterol like? What's, what are your, what's your baseline uh, liver function at? What's your kidney function at? Uh, do we see any blood abnormalities? Uh, and uh, do we see anemia? Because uh, a lot of younger women will uh, have anemia as early as this age. Any thyroid issues? Uh, are we identifying obesity? Uh, and um, if you're, uh, or are we identifying any, uh, the opposite, like um, cachexia or um, uh eating disorders, um, and uh, excessive weight loss. Um, and then uh, we are able to identify like uh, any health conditions that may be secondary to uh, the weight, uh, whether it's uh, on the lower side or on the higher side. Uh, identify things like sleep apnea. We ask questions. We And this is, I've diagnosed this in 20-year-olds. Uh, so uh, you reach out. But I think that's about... 50% of um, the things that they need. And uh, we recommend exercise. A lot of them are exercising. A lot of them are actually doing sports or intellectual work. Sleep-wise, uh, younger people usually um, are somewhat sleep-deprived. I used to be sleep-deprived when I was that age. So, you know, going back, what would I change? Um, I think I would sleep more. Um, I would... Uh, I would uh, feel better. I would have been, you know, more productive and uh, probably looked younger at this age uh, had I uh, kept up with my sleep. Um, but I also understand how hard it is uh, in uh, uh, school and college life. But we identify and catch up on those. Remind the kids to always wear seatbelts, uh, no drunk driving. Um, you know, we, we encourage them not to drink. Uh, no drugs. Uh, now even uh, marijuana has become uh, uh, legal. So we we tend to remind them it used to be like uh, taboo, but now we ask and a lot of them say, yes, I do. And then we just remind them that it's still, uh, you don't, they don't want to be uh, doing anything under the influence. Um, so if you have time, then go for it. But if you have time, try to catch up on some sleep uh, is what I recommend. But uh, anyways, my point of uh, starting with the younger population was that uh, what I'm recognizing is uh, mental health is uh, a big part of uh, their uh, preventive care. Uh, they are still getting exposed to the world. Every day is a new challenge, a new opportunity. They're, they're just being bombarded by information. And uh, a lot of things like uh, new friends, new people, new places, new relationships, uh, uh, you know, uh, new subjects, new teachers every day. You're, it's, it's a lot of influx of information and uh, would never train them how to handle the situation if you're not keeping up because uh, they, they may be away from parents at this time or they're not... Uh, you know, trying to share this with their uh, with the parents because uh, they might come across as like uh, not being able to keep up uh, with their peers and uh, not good enough. Uh, those kind of feelings start coming in. So uh, mental health and uh, to check on them is uh, very important. And I'll also tell you, I have not yet had any young uh, kid. Uh, by young kid, I mean like 18 to 24, 23, 24. If they haven't come alone, uh, who, who with their parents or with their um, 
uh, friends or uh, sometimes they have their girlfriend, uh, but someone accompanying them because obviously going to the doctor all by yourself is scary. Uh, but nobody has mentioned or came to me saying that uh, I need uh, help with uh, my mental health because um, they don't know what it is and if that's the problem and if I'm the right person to be reaching out to. So uh, usually in the first uh, visit, we just, uh, it's a relationship building exercise. If uh, these patients will trust me, they'll come back and they'll reach out if they need help. Um, and uh, if, uh, and then, you know, we do whatever is needed to help them. But I think that's 50% or more of uh, preventive care in a young adult uh, recognizing and identifying uh, these issues and uh, being able to help them. Um, and then, uh, of course, um, sexually transmitted diseases, STDs, also uh, equally important in uh, younger adults. Uh, they don't like to talk about it, so we usually will have to probe and ask. It gets very tricky if they're with parents. Um, same thing, uh, if you build uh, trust and relationship uh, with your doctor, you can always address it at another time. You can come back, and that's what a lot of my patients have done, that uh, they'll have a great visit, everything is perfect, everything is fine, there are uh, no issues. But then uh, a few weeks later, I see they've made an appointment, and they're here to discuss some issues because you know they've had time to think, they have time to uh, build some trust, and uh, they feel that, okay, it's uh, probably better uh, to just go to the doctor and um, discuss what could be bothering them uh, than just uh, Googling it and uh, getting more scared. Um, so anyways, these are the things that we keep an eye out for. Uh, talk to your doctor if you have more questions, anything like that. Uh, now we're going to... Uh, uh, the middle uh people get offended when we call them middle-aged but uh, i'm gonna just go with 40 and above uh a lot of things uh up until like anywhere i'm gonna go say 20 to 40 is uh, pretty much the same situational vaccinations routine blood work to check if any underlying conditions screening for diabetes checking your blood pressure uh, I, I see blood pressure in younger people, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, some early in their 20s can develop high blood pressure. So the only way to catch high blood pressure is check it. Uh, it won't have any signs or symptoms. Um, so blood pressure screenings and checking your cholesterol, risk stratification, kind of like, you know, a doctor's advice to uh, not eat pizza is uh, sometimes uh, more valuable than uh, your mom's advice to not eat pizza. Uh, so uh, it's like those things. You come in, you uh, you know, and then you Google it, but uh, you realize that you have a resource uh, to reach out to and um, not necessarily uh, do you have to go crazy with uh, uh, Googling stuff and uh, or putting it up on various forums like, oh, I have this rash, what should I do about it? Uh, things like that. So... Uh, and that, I think, goes very well until, uh, you know, your 30s to 40s. Uh, and mental health still at least 50% important. I wish someone had, um, you know, any of my mentors or any of my uh, teachers or uh, anybody I know uh, had given me that advice that, uh, you know, mental health is uh, equally important and uh, nobody taught you, trained you, or uh, showed you how to uh, handle yourself uh, under certain situations or circumstances and how to handle the pressure of life as it uh, comes along. So yeah, um, that's up until, and then up until like 40. At 40, uh, we start uh, with women. We are... Um, uh, you know, we start checking for mammograms. And this is assuming you're perfectly healthy uh, because uh, if there's a history of breast cancer in the family, uh, and yeah, that these things are also taken to preventive health care, like knowing what's, uh, what's your genetic, uh, uh, you know, what conditions run in your family that uh, we should be looking out for and screening for. 
Uh, but at 40, the recommendations are that we start doing mammograms for women and um, and assuming they're already seeing their gynecologist for regular pap smears, uh, <clears throat> you know, people start developing um, cervical cancer, breast cancer, uh, commonly in their late 30s and early 40s. Uh, we've seen that a lot. Um, and uh, so these things are really important because uh, if caught early, they're no big deal. Uh, most people, even with breast cancer, uh, they do very well. The survival rate is excellent. Uh, it's, um, uh, again, uh, nobody, you know, wishes, and I don't wish that upon anyone, uh, to turn out positive, but, uh, it's one of those things. The sooner you find out, uh, the more likely you're going to get out and, um, uh, uh, very high survival rate and go back to your life uh, as uh, soon as possible. Uh, so, and, and then we go into uh, at about 45, it used to be 50, but now at 45, we're doing uh, colon cancer screenings, um, uh, checking for a check, whether we check the stool, we get a colonoscopy or we do a, a DNA test uh, with the stool, uh, screening for any uh, cancer cells uh, in the colon. Um, Still, we are, these are new recommendations to start at 45. Uh, American College of Physicians are still recommending we stick with the 50, uh, but uh, the gastroenterology board recommends starting at 45. Um, so either ways, uh, talk to your doctor uh, what would be the most appropriate for you. Uh, if there's any family member in, um, uh, with a history of colon cancer, uh, then no question 45. Um, but other than that, like uh, we have started recommending at the age of 45. Uh, but, uh, you know, we haven't really pushed anyone uh, being very crazy about this either. Um, but at 50, uh, it's very important because, uh, you know, every now and then we, uh, not every now and then, very frequently we diagnose uh, people with the colon cancer or breast cancer and, uh, you know, the sooner we catch it, the better it is. So uh, those recommendations start kicking in, like we start screening for, you know, breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer. Um, sometimes the recommendations are like, well, should you, shouldn't you? And, um, and that's where you go and talk to your doctor and try to figure out what is the best situation for you. Um, and then a lot of my patients uh, feel that... Um, a full cardio uh, cardiac checkup is uh, necessary. Uh, well, as part of your well visit or your general preventive health care, uh, we do an EKG uh, just to get a baseline of uh, what your heart is, uh, what your heart signals are like. So we have something to compare. But generally, unless there are any symptoms, uh, there's no like baseline cardiac checkup uh, uh, for like, a, there's no baseline stress test or echocardiogram or things. We, unless I hear a murmur or you describe something that will make me think that, oh, you should see a cardiologist, we should get uh, a stress test or an echocardiogram, which is the ultrasound of the heart. Uh, let's get those, those uh, things checked out. Uh, but yeah, just uh, an idea. And then for women, as we go forward, like after menopause, we start looking for uh, bone density exams, we continue with the mammograms, we continue with the pap smears, um, and uh, the colon cancer screenings, uh, so these things. But at 40, 40 to 50, I still see a lot of um, mental health uh, issues in a lot more men than in women. Um, now, the situation and the circumstances are different, uh, but, uh, you know, it's it's always worth probing and uh, discussing with the doctor if you are dealing with this. There's a, this, this is a whole talk uh, in uh, mental health in middle-aged men or men in their 40s and early 50s, um, maybe even until 60s. So uh, that's uh, where we uh, check on that. Again, it's not saying that uh, women don't deal with mental health, uh, but uh, 
especially between the ages of 45 to 55. In my experience, uh, I've uh, uh, seen a lot more men uh, who are uh, dealing with it, and most of them will not talk about it. Um, but if probed, then uh, they do, and it's surprisingly common. Um, then, you know, we, we keep on uh, with these screenings, and after 60, the it changes to functions of daily living. Uh, you know, how are people coping with uh, their medications? Like uh, a lot of people will have, they're already on medications, whether they have high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol. Um, not many people are exercising like they should. And a lot of them have developed uh, uh, various uh, joint pains. Arthritis has kicked in. Uh, and this is, you know, I'm talking about men and women at around this age. How, uh, you know, and at this point, uh, what's going on with their um, functions of daily living? Are they able to, you know, are they going shopping? Are they uh, going out? Are they socializing enough uh, because they might have some issues with pain or incontinence or um, there are certain medications that make them pee too frequently that it starts affecting their social life. They don't want to go anywhere. Um, and if they, you know, walk too much, they get short of breath, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, we, we like to find out like, uh, how their medical conditions are affecting their personal lives and are they beginning to, um, you know, not do a lot of things that they would otherwise do. Uh, just because um, they feel somewhat um, less independent. Uh, so this is where, after that, it starts affecting their mind. Uh, so mental health is, again, uh, very important. But I think before that, we identify, like, what are the things that are keeping them from doing what they need to do? And this is where we can usually um, find ways to help them a little bit. Um, you know, if you have joint pains or arthritis or uh, exertion, this is when we actually start diagnosing medical conditions and uh, and uh, start fixing them. And the goal of diagnosing and fixing uh, a lot of these medical conditions is to give them their freedom back, that uh, your health, uh, you know, whatever you got, whatever cards you've been dealt, uh, what can we do to keep you back on your feet, on your track, on the things that you like to do and you want to do and not be limited by a uh, condition that you may not know that has a good uh, chance of uh, treatment or cure or management. Uh, and then after the age of 75, um, a lot of the recommendations actually stop. Um, at that time, obviously, more important, uh, we are paying more attention to uh, their, um, not quite mental health, but their brain health. Uh, are we starting to, you know, lose some brain cells? Uh, and uh, the activities of daily living, the limitations because of any of the conditions that they might have, uh, that they might have, uh, joint issues, arthritis, uh, et cetera, uh, how limited is the activity? And uh, that becomes a more of a priority in identifying these things. And uh, mental, mentally, are they able to keep up with their finances? Because a lot of these uh, scams out there, they are targeting these older folk um, because uh, they may be making some uh, financial decisions that are not very sound. Um, of course, um, we all make a lot of financial decisions that are not very sound all the time, but uh, I think you all know what I'm uh, trying to say. Um, um, and then uh, we screen for falls. If they fall in once, can they fall again? Do they get dizzy, lightheaded? And uh, a big focus is on checking their medications. If uh, any of the medications that I have prescribed or the uh, other specialists may have prescribed uh, do we need to pull back or adjust? And uh, really, every single time we try to identify that, do you 
still need this medication. Uh, and sometimes we get a, a look at what the recommendations are, but then do these recommendations really apply to this person? We tailor the medications uh, based on the judgment, based on their family history, based on their lifestyle, based on what they really want in life, and uh, what are we trying to uh, really achieve here. And when we put that all in perspective, that's preventive healthcare, um, knowing these things uh, and trying to address them before they happen. And sometimes a lot of it is just education for the patient uh, or their families and helping them understand that there is a difference between um, you know, what's written in the books, what's on Google, what's, uh, uh, what uh, is uh, the guidelines, and uh, what do we really want based on what the patient wants, and uh, being able to educate everyone uh, how to make better decisions uh, becomes important. Uh, and then, uh, so that's kind of like now after 75 just taking a rough number. Sometimes we see a little bit earlier, sometimes later, but that's when, you know, preventive is like a lot of, uh, uh, looking out for, and then we do blood work frequently, uh, looking out for any side effects, complications from the medications and, uh, the activity and their mobility issues. And, uh, and then sleep starts becoming an issue. The uh, people sleep less and less as they get older and uh, obviously the interaction between uh, the families and how the caregivers are handling it. And <clears throat> lastly, uh, depression becomes uh, depression and loneliness. Uh, loneliness probably leading to depression starts becoming a big issue at this age and uh, they never talk about it. Um, and um, so, uh, and then, you know, a quick uh, identification of uh, if uh, dementia has uh, started, uh, you know, creeping in. Um, so these are, this is what a preventive care visit is. So, uh, so, and, and then as a caregiver, you can be in your 20s or 30s <clears throat> taking care of any older adult. You're part of the preventive care as well, education of uh, the caregivers and uh, trying to identify caregiver stress um, and you identifying like uh, what could you do better and not be surprised uh, at those things, what is needed, what can be done, what should be done. Um, those things are all part of preventive care. So uh, see, it's um, I've been talking for about 30 minutes or more about uh, preventive care and I could probably go on for another 30 <clears throat> based on different scenarios, situations, but I thought uh, having a general outline of uh, what uh, what a preventive care actually is, and what to expect, and how to go about it, um, this should be helpful for you. Um, and uh, this is what your doctor is generally trying to do. So sometimes, uh, you know, you're spending a lot of time. Sometimes it might seem like that's it. It was like five minutes. But in general, uh, we are trained as doctors to identify uh, what are the best recommendations for you at that age, at that time? Um, and what are we looking for um, <clears throat> based on uh, the history that you provide or you don't provide? Um, so these are the things that we um, do. And I would suggest like, uh, uh, you know, do not forget to eat healthy and exercise daily. Uh, <clears throat> That's another long topic, uh, but I think I would like to do that over some question and answer because everybody's going to tell you eat healthy and uh, exercise daily, but uh, that's very tricky. Uh, what is uh, healthy for who and how much exercise is more appropriate for who? And when they can't uh, either eat healthy, whatever is healthy for them, or they can't exercise, you know, what is what the government is recommending, then how do you still um, get good nutrition and uh, uh, maintain mobility and um, activity? So I, I think that can be a good talk uh, in the future, uh, but I would like to do that with questions. So shoot your questions. Uh, 
and let me know. Um, so uh, I'm Dr. Vikram Gupta. I'm a practicing family physician in North Jersey, uh, United States of America. And uh, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And uh, at some point, I think we want to reach um, where we can have a live uh, session, uh, maybe 30 minutes to an hour. And uh, I can hopefully gain your trust enough to answer questions uh, that will help uh, guide you and uh, reduce the anxiety that uh, in general you would get. Um, and uh, probably not just to make some generic recommendations that, uh, that are already out there. So uh, you guys are still watching this because uh, you're looking for a more specific answer that should apply to you. And I'm just giving you the opportunity. Maybe you can just ask. All right. Well, thank you very much. Please subscribe to my channel and I will see you next week. Thank you.